Um, that CTS talk, um, New Research Directions in the Archaeology and Linguistic History of the Hokkaido Isle, co-sponsored by the Archaeological Research Facility. I'm Junko Habu, I'm Professor of the Department of Anthropology and a member of the Center for Japanese Studies and Archaeological Research Facility. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon, uh, very late, um, 3 p.m. I'm very pleased to see that um, guys all came to this talk. Today I have a privilege of introducing our speaker, Professor Gary Crawford of the Department of Anthropology of the University of Toronto. Professor Crawford um, is a professor uh, <coughs> at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus. His archaeological research has taken him throughout Eastern North America, China, and Japan. And um, his specialty is paleo of the botany, and today, um, in the morning, we were able to visit Professor <coughs> Christine Hustle's lab, look at um, her type collection, and talk to the students. So um, <coughs> part of his identity is really paleo ethnobotanist, but at the same time, his love for Japanese and East Asian archaeology um, it's very clear, and I've been trying to convince him to come to Berkeley and talk um, about his specialty. And uh, um, I've got a lot of great things to talk about him, but I think uh, we'll move on to the talk today. Uh, the topic is um, the Hokkaido um, indigenous people in Hokkaido, the Ainu people. Uh, some of you may know, um, in the study of Ainu people, in Japan has this long history that some of the physical anthropologists uh, <clears throat> were trying to connect the Ainu people directly to the prehistoric Jomon people. While um, the connection is there to a certain extent, um, you also have to understand the history, the dynamic history of the Ainu people uh, <clears throat> from Hokkaido Jomon people to uh, the epijomon, and then you see um, very strong evidence of plant cultivation. And then throughout the medieval period to um, the Edo period, you see that they were key players for really dynamic trade um, with China through northern world. Those of you who are in Japanese studies may have learned that um, on the official side, Japan was closing its door to the rest of the world, apart from two ports, um, um, apart from Nagasaki and through the Okinawan route, um, to only two countries, China and the uh, Dutch people. But in reality, this Hokkaido route, uh, the best part of Chinese uh, imported materials to Japan actually came through the northern route, um, through Hokkaido. And that trade network was established before the Edo period, kept functioning throughout the Edo period. And uh, what we see ethnographically um, in the early native period of Ainu as uh, hunter gatherers is after the long historic transformation of the history. And I think Professor Gary Crawford's talk really highlights the importance of uh, plant cultivation in the earlier part of the. <coughs> Uh, Ainu people's um, <coughs> tradition. And there are a lot of issues that are um, changed, our understanding is quickly changed. And I'm very excited to learn um, about his um, most recent research results. So please welcome <coughs> Professor Gary Crawford. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for that kind introduction. And I also appreciate the invitation to speak to you all. Um, it's great to explore some of these ideas because uh, I hadn't been thinking about this for a long time. And um, I got an email from John Whitman, who I'm crediting as a co-author here, who is a linguist at Cornell. And um, fortunately, he, for me at least, his partner is actually a linguist at the University of Toronto. And he happens to spend a lot of time there. So we grabbed a coffee together and he expressed his frustrations with what the traditional archaeologists were telling him about the archaeology of the North and its relationship to the Ainu and Ainu language, because he had a perspective on Ainu historical linguistics that just didn't fit with the archaeology. We had about a one hour conversation, and everything just sort of fit. And so we've decided to work on a paper together and see where it'll go. So, 
uh, it's, it's, really, it's really fun trying to, you know, when, when this kind of synergy happens and you get to think about things that you've been thinking about for a long time, but they, they take a new life and, um, and it's kind of really refreshing. There's some other themes that are happening, for example, at the University of Toronto right now, where we're very specifically working on, on a decolonized curriculum. Uh, a decolonized research agenda and we're building very close relationships with indigenous Canadians and um, in a few weeks we're opening a new building and it has an indigenous name that honors a local indigenous um, uh, fellow and um, we have uh, we have uh, an indigenous advisor on campus where we're really building these strong relationships and now when I go to Hokkaido and Hokkaido University, I start asking sort of pointed questions about these kinds of things. And, and there is a lot more attention, as you know, being paid to the Ainu and their role in, in Japanese society. But, but we need to keep the momentum going and hopefully develop it. And I think about where the archaeologists fit in this. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from this. So, I mean, Junko's already said that, that the Ainu uh, have already, have, they've had a, a very kind of loosely informed impact on, on Japanese archaeology and what it means to be Japanese. And um, so I like to think sort of critically about how the Ainu fit into the history of Japan instead of kind of buying into sort of long-held concepts of the Ainu, for, for example, as an isolated, authentic, primitive hunting and gathering society, or even simply ignoring them is a huge issue. So quite a number of us have been working on how this image came to be and particularly thinking about this colonization narrative. And I think that archeology span can have and ought to have a role in, in this whole reconsideration. And, um, and so we have these images, sorry? Oh yeah, why not? If, I mean, it's good for you, yes. I have no problem because I'm not looking at the slides very much, so. Um, so I'm thinking about a decolonized agenda and how we address the Ainu and how they're conceptualized and, and treated. Really, it's interesting, at this moment in Japan, when the Ainu have sort of high, finally been recognized by the Japanese government. And interestingly enough, too, that this, there's some irony here, too, in some ways, that Hokkaido just celebrated its 150th anniversary, particularly of its naming, but also of the formal colonization period. And so this last 150 years has really marked an intensified period of colonization. And so I think we, can, we need to think about Ainu indigeneity and their origins, and as well as engaging the Ainu in archaeological practice in Hokkaido and elsewhere. So, um, and I keep reminding, when I speak to my audiences, I've actually only given this paper once before, uh, and a very brief version of it at the SAAs last spring, and so I'm really developing it now. And I re like to remind my, my audiences who are not involved in Japanese studies that these are not past people. I mean, the Ainu still live in Hokkaido, and they are real people with with individual identities who have different views on the meaning of indigeneity and what they want out of this. And Junko and I had a really interesting conversation about this this morning. Um, so you have the young people being brought up in, in, a, in a society that is quite complex for them. And you may be familiar with uh, uh, Kayano-san here, who, who was perhaps one of the, the main proponents of um, getting uh, the Japanese, the getting the Ainu identity out in the open, and he became an activist and had a formal uh, a post with the Japanese government and, and, and so on. And he's also a scholar, obviously, publishing a, an Ainu dictionary. And, um, and then you have in the middle um, um, an artist who is, who ha is absolutely incredible. And, uh, on the right, you have um, Hatakayama-san, who, who is a, who is a, a, who's taking activism to a very personal level, and he is, he's really, in his retirement, uh, he's retired from being a whaler, and and he describes how the Japanese authorities sort of turned a blind eye to he and his crew, who had quite a successful 
career whaling. Uh, he gave it up because he started to feel very guilty about what he was doing and he's getting older and he wouldn't advise his kids to take up whaling. But he has decided to um, just simply use civil disobedience to get attention to Ainu fishing rights. And, um, and in terms of wood carving, I just want to show you this. Um, uh, this is a piece that he has in the National Art Gallery in Canada. Kaizawa Toru. And Kaizawa san, um, a wonderful guy. Um, every time I go to Hokkaido, I make sure I go up and, uh, and see him and discuss uh, what's going on in his life. And, um, and so the last year or so I've been visiting him, he's been struggling with this owl sculpture that now sits in, whoops, in Sapporo Station. And you can see it incorporates elements of this sculpture in, in this. And um, I'll leave it to you to try to read into what he's showing. But he's, he's trying to build irony and humor into his, in his, in, into his sculpture. So he's not following a, a completely traditional perspective on dealing with identity. And I'm just trying to show you here that there, that there is no one single way that even Ainu people think about their identity. But archaeology has kind of worked within a specific framework. And this foundation that Hanihara published in 1992 is, is a valuable model to look at. Um, so as, as, just to show you briefly what's going on, in his model, the Ainu would be these unilineal descendants of the Jomon. And um, that they would go through the Jomon, through the Epi-Jomon, and that's kind of important because they'll be discussing the Epijomon shortly, and the Epijomon become, become the Ainu in his model. But this is based primarily on biological affinities, and his, his, um, his dual origins hypothesis is certainly provocative and got a lot of people thinking and testing uh, ideas, but it didn't deal with culture particularly well. So um, this is the dual model with the, the Ainu and the modern Japanese here. And within this dual model were, say, the Ryukyu Islanders and the Okinawans who were lumped with the Ainu. And, and so the, the sense was that there's a migration into Japan and the peripheries, being Hokkaido and the Ryukyus, remained relatively indigenous. Just about everybody is trying to rethink the complexity here, who's working there. So this is my version. <laughs> The, the sort of the foundation diagram is still very helpful to me. It's very helpful. Um, this is part, this is largely still informed from mitochondrial DNA, the DNA from a number of, uh, from a fairly large sample that Adachi and colleagues published in 2018. And so in addition to this Jomon component, it's still there. Uh, this model shows that there's a significant sort of female input, the mitochondrial DNA input from the Ohotsk people, uh, which would be sort of a mainland Northeast Asian genome. And there's been a question about how much of a role did these Ohotsk people play in the development of the Ainu. Um, so you can see that there is, um, there are a number of contributors to this. There's still a Jomon component and there is this modern Japanese component, and there is there is um, uh, there are other components as well. Without getting into too much detail, just take a look at this PLOS One paper, 2018. Uh, on the language side, uh, and so if you, I'm gonna I'm gonna cop out here. If you have any detailed questions about Ainu linguistics, I'll just say write to John. Whitman and he can answer them, but I think I'm going to be able to give you a bit of a, a picture here. And so what troubled John when we had our initial conversation was that he came to me saying that with, with Hanihara's model, uh, he was perplexed because linguistically, uh, I knew historical linguistics indicates that the language is relatively young, maybe no more than a thousand years old. And so the Ainu historical linguistics information says that it's not a surviving Jomon language. It appears to be a lingua franca, a contact language. 
and it's consistent with non-Jomon origins of Ainu culture. So we're gonna I'm going to look at that a little bit more in detail as, as I go on. And one of, the, one of the catalysts for rethinking this happened in the early 1980s. And um, I had just finished my PhD thesis, was in my first few years as a faculty member at the University of Toronto. And I was encouraging my colleagues to use flotation, collect plant remains from any archaeological site you can. And um, so at this point, there was, I guess, a population boom at Hokkaido University. They needed to put in new buildings. And it turns out that the Hokkaido University campus is just a whole series of archaeological sites. Jomon right through to proto-historic and, and, and later. And um, they faculty sat down to create a plan for rescuing these sites. Should we not build on these sites? Should we build? They went ahead and built, but they set up a salvage archaeology center and developed an archaeology program on campus that still exists. So anytime anything is constructed on campus at Hokkaido University, they do archaeological work. And this particular case was a dormitory, student dormitory that was going to be constructed. And so this really odd footprint of the Sakushikotone-Gawa site or Sakushikotone River site. Sakushikotone River is, the, is this creek, this river that flows right through the campus. And, um, and um, in order to build this dormitory, they had to rescue this archaeological site because in this area, you can actually walk through the woods and walk through the area and you can still see pit houses. Uh, they're still there, you can count them, uh, and, um, and in fact in one area of the site, the Ainu people today have set up a shrine to, to, for the ancestors and um, they consider this, this particularly important uh, land for them. And that area is what we would call belonging to the Satsumon culture, and uh, more on that in a second. But um, so we s started flotation there, and um, Professor Yoshizaki was my mentor there, and he was more or less he was in charge of the project, and he had a young man working for him um, named Matsuoka, who I believe right now is president of a, of a university in southern Japan somewhere. But Matsuoka took it under his wing to get this flotation done. And um, I got a call a couple of months after this project started saying, you're not going to believe what we found. And I didn't quite believe them. So I, as soon as the term was over, the semester was over, I got on a plane and went to Sapporo. And this is what was awaiting me. Um, these flotation samples blew me away. So this is just one sample of about 10 liters. And in this sample are probably 10,000 seeds. And these 10,000 seeds include mostly domesticated plants. And this, and since the Satsumon are the direct ancestors of the Ainu, this raised some rather important questions. Uh, the other thing was the radiocarbon dates on them. We AMS dated um, some grains, and they came out between 800 and 1000 AD. So it's very, very clear this stuff isn't contaminated. And this collection is massive. We've probably got a half a million seeds in this collection, and we're still working on it. And um, the, the, the range of taxa here brought to light a whole new agricultural complex that we knew nothing about. And this is a dry system of farming, unlike the, the wet rice paddy field production. And there wasn't much in the literature about this, certainly nothing in the archaeological literature about this type of, this type of, um, of farming. And, and it's just incredible. So virtually every dry crop that existed in East Asia at the time, and certainly North Asia at the time, shows up in Hokkaido. And um, I include a few things here as crops just because I think they deserve to be here, particularly um, ground cherry. And uh, 
a very tasty, very tasty plant related to the tomato. And, um, and we only find it really in these agricultural contexts. So they've got everything from uh, perilla, flax, wheat, all beans, uh, hemp even, uh, barley. There's uh, safflower, which is kind of curious. Um, millets, three types of millet. There's rice. We only get about 20 rice grains at the site, which doesn't speak to them necessarily growing it in the area, and I doubt that they were, although there is a, at least one site in, in, uh, in Hokkaido, not far from Sapporo, where they have hundreds and hundreds of grains of, of rice. So at first blush, this, okay, this is all introduced. So are, are they trading this in? What kind of a plant exploitation pattern have they got? Well, there is a tremendous range of local plants. So these people clearly understood the local plant systems. So these people knew these plants. They, they used, this is just a, a smattering of the main ones, um, most of which are mentioned in Ainu ethnobotanies. Um, and um, uh, these grasses tend to be the weeds of fields. So these are telltale sign that cultivation was taking place quite locally. So, and then there are even aquatic plants. Pondweed shows up. And um, there's another. Uh, this is curious because one of this, this species is thought by botanists to be an introduced plant to Japan, if not Hokkaido. So uh, was it part of the agricultural complex? Um, there's another one I wanted to look at here. Um, a black nightshade is critical. Well, anyway, we can, we can move on. And, the, and there's a whole series, oh, the, here it is here. So there are many kind of arboreal species that these people were exploiting too, uh, including, um, you know, colloquially speaking, this is wild kiwi, the actinidia, um, matatabi, that kind of thing. Um, lots, and elderberry grows all over campus, as does actinidia. Uh, not much raspberry, but we do get it archaeologically. Um, lots of this, and we have to look at, try to go back and look at it to see whether it's a lacquer tree or closely related species. Nuts aren't that very, aren't that common here. We do get them, but it doesn't seem to be a huge uh, interest of theirs. Um, crowberry is kind of intriguing because it's usually a high elevation plant or out in sort of the coastal regions of Hokkaido. So are they, are they going out and bringing it back or have they transplanted this crop it, into uh, the Sapporo area? Diverse, diverse set of, of plants that if you take the wild plants that they're using, it looks like just about any other assemblage in, in, um, in uh, the jomon or epijomon, that kind of thing. But it's the other crops that they're, that they're, um, that they're using getting these phone calls. Oh, sorry. To put this in some perspective then, this, this, this discovery, although it seems like simple, okay, we found an agricultural complex, let's just work on the crops and move on. Well, the implications are what interests me as well. So if we take a look at this, we see the Jomon here uh, ending earlier in southwestern Japan and time passing and the Ayoi moves north and then we see the final Jomon throughout Hokkaido and northern Tohoku. And then we're familiar with the fact that the Jomon meets its demise ultimately with the, and I'm speaking culturally now, with the, with the Yayoi beginning. And I've tried to find some colors to try to tune in how much of what's coming in. but. But we get the Tohoku Yayoi moving into um, and developing in the north. And, and, and here we see kind of acculturation taking place. We see probably some migrants interacting with the local people. But the Tohoku Yayoi has a very specific character that looks in many ways still very Jomon. And, um, and then subsequently, and, here, and I don't believe in coincidences, so when we, we see pottery styles change, we see some adjustments in subsistence, at the same time we see the Tohoku Yayoi developing. That led to some conversations over drinks about whether this continuing Jomon, the Epi Jomon, is really a Hokkaido Yayoi. I mean, what is it? But the absence of rice meant to archeologists you can't possibly call it Yayoi. But clearly, 
these people were communicating and there was something going on getting this development into the epijomon. And so the kinds of things we see, pottery styles changing dramatically, but there's even more happening that I'll look at in a second. And keep in mind that this is the group that Hanihara's dual model said were the ancestors of the Ainu. And this is where a little bit of data could be a dangerous thing, these, this plant data. So there's a lot of interaction here. And then we see further developments. Of course, everybody knows these periods, the Kofun, and the Kofun has influence up in Tohoku as well. And these folks are interacting with them as well. And then the Nara period comes along. And interestingly enough, there's something happens in Tohoku uh, um, that may be the ancestral Satsumon. And this is, where, this is where a lot of research needs to be done. Are we dealing with Wajin? Are we dealing with, with what here? And, and um, I just threw this up as Satsumon for a reason that I'll show you in a second. Uh, and that's when we see the Satsumon develop in Hokkaido. And develop is the, perhaps the wrong word. What we see is a sudden appearance of the Satsumon in Hokkaido. There's, there's no development from epijomon into the satsumon. It's just the epijomon sort of fades out, and then boom, you've got the satsumon in place. And then uh, the Heian period is interacting with the sats satsumon as well, and the pottery becomes uh, very, very similar to haji pottery from the south. So in fact, for a while, uh, our team started calling the satsumon pottery Ezohaji pottery. Um, but that fell into disuse and is still simply called uh, Satsumon pottery. So that's kind of the historical narrative and still a lot of interaction going on. And the Ohotsk is here. I'm not ignoring them, but I'm not focusing on them either. So that's part of it. Okay, so then the other part of the model we know is that throughout mainland Japan, the Yayoi developed and the Jomon faded as a result of sort of hybridization, acculturation, and continuation. And Mizoguchi in 2013 had a, had a wonderful article on this, so I just refer you to him. And, and this kind of was facilitated by existing networks. It's not like there was no connection north and south before this, but these networks of perhaps trade and exchange and communication had existed throughout the Jomon period. They shifted and moved and so forth. But what the evidence seems to show is as the Yoyoi is moving up, goods are moving north and south as well. And my colleague at Hokudai uh, has a paper where he discusses certain, certain goods coming down the Japan sea coast and certain uh, goods going down the Pacific coast and back and forth in, the, in those routes. And, uh, and, uh, and so there's some complexities going on here. And we see these connections between the epijomon and the yayoi in material culture. So for example, this is kohoku, this is epijomon pottery. It's quite distinct from the jomon, the preceding jomon. And, um, and maybe calling it jomon is a mistake, but I think when you look at the biological data and so forth, it, there's still a lot of cord marking and so forth. You might just as well. Um, this is Yayoi pottery traded into Hokkaido. So this is from the Sapporo Station site. There are glass beads that show up on these sites. And there is a kind of a boundary in, in this area. So um, the main sort of distribution of epijomon tends to stop through here with more of the Yayoi here. And, um, and uh, you, get, uh, you get trade wear showing up here from the Yayoi as well. Uh, and, um, and so what do these epijomon sites look like? Well, this is, uh, this is one in, um, in the, in, uh, not too far from, I, I, um, I guess it's in uh, Eniwa, I think, uh, the Kyuto Yuhira Kahan site. And there are the dates up there. And you can see there are still pit houses, these very jomon-like pit houses. But it's also riddled with a vast array of post holes. And one idea that folks discuss there is that about five kilometers away is a, um, is a fish trap site, uh, Ebetsubuto. And 
uh, there's some thought that they were bringing the salmon back here to dry and process and that we may be seeing the footings for um, racks for drying, for drying fish and so forth. Uh, and uh, the fish exploitation is, is, uh, is something that changes in the epigomone as well. And I have a slide to show you about that in a second. And then um, another crucial point in the epigomone is evidenced by a couple of cave sites. Uh, in the Yoichi area. And uh, these are pretty much the only two cave sites in Japan with rock art. And, and it seems like a very important, I don't want to use the word ritual center, but I would say spiritually important location. And um, this is a Fugope Cave and um, discovered by some students many, many years ago. Beautiful museum there today. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend that you go and see it. But, um, and there are radiocarbon dates, about one of them, as I point out here, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and the, the, the walls are just covered in symbols, just covered in symbols. And uh, here you see an individual that's likely a human and a bird together, and people discuss the fact that perhaps um, they're they had dances that mimicked the, the, the cranes dance and so forth. Um, but I just point that out to you because, well, I mean, when you think about this, what, what is going on in terms of, of, of ritual? Why, why is it that this incredibly important spiritual site shows up at this point when there's communication between the Yayoi and and the, um, and the Jomon up here in, in Hokkaido. And one can speculate there's really no good explanation other than, I mean, I wonder at times, and this is just complete um, just speculation, whether these folks are trying to find meaning and spiritual guidance at a time when things are changing. People are being exposed to for forces from outside Hokkaido. They're trying to interpret what's going on. Um, but this is not just only an epijomon site. So they have artifacts here from the far north. So people are almost, uh, people seem to be making a pilgrimage from very distant places to this locale to leave offerings. And, and, um, and it's just, I think this is open to, to study. And I wish there could be uh, more work done on this site. Um, but for the most part, I mean, the work at other Jomon sites is intriguing. And, and so we do have those pit communities like their final Jomon ancestors. But during, especially during the second half of the Epi Jomon, there seems to be a greater mobility develop. And we just don't find sites with pit houses much anymore. And uh, instead, what you find are burials. You find these charred lenses mixed in between the burials. So people seem to be attending these cemeteries, spending time living and eating there with their deceased relatives, and then moving on. And so here we see evidence of sort of death and evidence of mobility and temporary occupation. And in order to find evidence of activity areas and possible houses, this is a site in the northern quarter of Sapporo where people, the archaeologists have mapped charcoal and mapped other debris. And they, find, they do find these hot spots that they suggest may very well be dwellings. But that's, that's how evident they are. They require a great deal of, uh, of careful looking to see what's going on. So something is happening here. Um, uh, and the other thing about the epijomon, and um, well, no, their architectural skills weren't this well developed, but this, this, this is not the epijomon site, this is lo the location of a rather huge um, epijomon set of occupations spanning hundreds of years, covering a great air area of land. So when the new uh, Sapporo railway station was built, they had to go in and excavate this um, massive epijomon site. And I was fortunately um, doing research there at the time. 
and was able to do much of the archaeobotanical work on this site, which was really, really a godsend. Um, and all of these taxa show up in the earlier Jomon occupations. They show up in the Satsumon sites as well. Uh, so you have lots of acorns. Uh, we get, interesting enough, acorn, these amber cork tree berries are showing up. And, um, and uh, you find, you can identify them from the seeds in the interior. There's the sumac lacquer tree slash, other kind of woody plants here. Um, lot, there's some evidence of herbaceous plants, but not as many as what we find in the earlier and later periods. The, the Japanese knotweed is there. The leek is here, so we do find the bulbs of these leeks. Lot, some grasses are showing up, but not as prominently as we see in others. Oh, by the way, there uh, occasionally we find um, the odd barley grain or rice, and sometimes with the rice we find this uh, this weed, this co-evolved weed with the rice. So it hints that somewhere in Hokkaido they were growing rice, but it's quite possible it was being just simply being traded in from, from the Yayoi uh, cousins to the south. Uh, in terms of fish, just uh, here, all I want you to do is look at this and this and the length of the blue lines. Jomon, whole variety of Jomon sites, so Takase Sensei has put all this data together. What you, this, is, this is the Epi Jomon, the Zoku Jomon, and what you see is far more emphasis on fish by the time you get to the Epi Jomon. You do have Jomon sites with huge quantities of fish, but it depends on the site and what the particulars of that site are. And there's a greater emphasis on sort of getting into the interior with salmon. Whereas prior to that, there was not a lot of interest in salmon. Fish was, was quite a diverse selection of fish marine fish and so forth, but by the epijomon they're getting into salmon, particularly in the interior, but on the, the coastal areas they were going after other fish, for example, they were going after flatfish in many cases, and that was very specific uh, technology that's required. And um, to cast, this is salmon, I mean, the salmon from the Sapporo Station site is just huge, huge quantities of this stuff. and. Um, they obviously very interested in it. Um, on the plants, again, I'm telling you that the range of taxa is similar to what other people in Hokkaido were using through time. And I just want to show you that if you quantify it all, there's some real distinctions. So you get these low-level types of other, low-level appearances of certain types of plants. Grape is primarily a later epijomon one, not sure why. Um, and in the earlier, uh, it's Japanese knotweed they're going after. And again, it's like very specific. It's not so much that I'm worried about which plants they were using, but one of the things that happens with the plants is they're focusing on very specific plants. And in, in the nut area, between the very beginning of the, of the epijamon and the very end of it, they're harvesting lots of walnut. But in between, they're interested in chestnut. <laughs> so for me, the big distinction is you're not seeing a trend. You're not seeing some walnut and then lots of walnut, or it seems to be boom or bust. We're going to the site and we're going after salmon. We're going after the site in this period, we're going after deer. When they're after deer, the deer bones are incredibly fragmentary. So they're, just, they're breaking them up and getting all kinds of small pieces. That they're just really, really exploiting these deer. Um, and what it says to me is that they're kind of opportunistic here. They're, they're going after the nuts that are available that year or that particular time they're visiting the site. Whether this is anthropogenic, whether they planted this stuff, whether they're, whether they're growing chestnut is something I don't have a clue about. But the main point here is that the epijomon subsistence is really, really different than the preceding jomon and the subsequent satsumon. And then if we, um, they're, they're, the small seeds are there, uh, include some of the things like kiwi, grape, and elderberry. So then you go to the south and we see what's going on with the yayoi. So the yayoi and tohoku were experimenting with rice. There are a couple of sites with rice paddies and, um, and they're quite extensive. But what it, 
what seems to have happened is that it failed. It, it either failed because of climate or something else, although Takase's research and his PhD thesis and so forth suggests that, in fact, there was a huge, there may have been a, there was a tsunami, there was a massive event along the coast which had a huge impact on, on people and led to the demise, a crash of the Ayoi and a breakup of the systems. But he also finds that in the Ayoi, there's an upland system where people are, are living sort of a Jomon style of life and a lowland style where they're growing, growing rice. So there's some diversity of subsistence regimes going on here. Uh, so their decline may have been because of this earthquake and a tsunami with some surviving populations. Uh, and they know this because of occupation levels covered with, with sediment. And then in this period, we start getting in the proto-historic period where there, are, there is some documentation over what's going on. And so this is an area that's controlled by, you know, this group, this mysterious group called the Emishi. And I, I think it's quite likely that we're talking about this sort of mixed group of of uh, people who ultimately may have been the ancestors of the Satsumon and perhaps the, and likely the Ainu. So they were, um, successive regimes were obviously trying to control this area and they were intensifying as time goes on. And um, there was pacification going on and there are, there are varying degrees of biological affinities between Jomon, Japanese colonists and so forth. So it's, it's a complex thing. What about the farming? Is there farming up here after, the, uh, after Yayoi? Yes. So this is where you find more dry crops than anything. You do find rice, but you do start to see barley and foxtail millet, Japanese millet, soybean, azuki, and so forth. Um, and you can then see hay on crops, very similar. And then, um, and for example, one of the earliest radiocarbon dates for the Satsumon is from this site that I helped excavate with a team. And um, we have a date of between 680 and 780 AD here. I'd like to get a more accurate high resolution date from this site because it's turning out to be probably pretty important. Um, so what about the Satsumon relationships? So here, here is sort of the, the culmination of this complex historical trajectory. And um, in this whole period, the role of the epijomon seems to be pretty minimal. So here's some Satsumon pottery in situ, a Satsumon house that is very much in the style of houses to the south. Um, and the general distribution of the Satsumon. So Satsumon, earlier Satsumon dates tend to be in southwestern Hokkaido, and as time passes, there's almost an abandonment of this area in favor of them moving to the north, which may help explain some of the connections with the Ohotsk people. But why that happened is another, is another issue. So this is what the pottery looks like. This is one example of these kinds of pots. And, they stop using cord marking. This is a very distinctive type of, of pottery, nothing at all like, like the epijomon. And, and at, the, at sort of the beginning of the Satsumon period, we find, um, and in throughout the Satsumon people period, we find iron. And some of the iron manufacturing was going on in Hokkaido. Uh, there is sueki, this pottery coming in from the south. And and Ebetsu is this, I'm standing in the midst of about 21 tombs. They look like Kofun tombs, but this is not the Kofun period. So these, and so there are lots of speculation over what this means. And there's one tomb just like this on the Hokkaido University campus. Uh, who these people are, these, these, the grave goods were um, very much from the south. So these are people who came into Hokkaido from the south and may represent this complexity of, of things that were going on up here. And then we move to the Ainu period 
Um, so ultimately, in this Setsmon period, we're seeing a mixed economy. I don't want to give you the impression that they've turned away from hunting, gathering, fishing. No, they've layered on agriculture and they continue to hunt and fish and gather. Um, so, and the Ainu, I mean, this fits with what we know about the Ainu in proto-historic periods too. And, um, and so this continued. And in the 13th century AD, we find evidence of agriculture. And really what's happening here with the Ainu period is we're just, people stop making pottery. And they start using more and more goods from the south. They're moving to a large scale utilization of metal. And uh, they've turned to larger, um, as you can see in this photograph, surface architecture. So they're not digging semi-subterranean houses, they're, digging, digging these, they're making these large rectangular houses that are built with their floors on the ground surface. And agriculture continued to be practiced. So some folks still try to say, well, how do we, how do we reconcile the, what we learn in early anth in our anthropology classes that the Ainu are a classic example of temperate forest hunters and gatherers. Well, I, I'm afraid that that's based on some misconceptions, potentially some misinformation, if I can be polite and diplomatic, uh, by the Japanese authorities to sort of make it a little easier to repress the indigenous peoples of Hokkaido, but that's a whole other story. Um, but um, so this is, this, these are Ainu fields covered by ash, um, and these Ainu fields date to roughly the, I think the 14th and 15th, no, the 13th and 14th centuries AD, and they're covered by 17th century volcanic ash. And we also have, so this is, this is the fish trap, fish weir, uh, recovered at the Sakushiko Tonigawa site, which is a Satsumon site, but they have a 15th century date on this fish trap, which means that the Sakushikotoni locality continued to be used by their descendants, the Ainu. So what about language now? Let's get into what John is, John Whitman is thinking about. So he points out that the linguistic, lexical, statistic, and Bayesian evidence date proto-Ainu to approximately 700 to 900 AD. Hmm. Surprisingly late date to the dates for the inception of the Jomon, and if the Ainu were a language or a language family that reflected the antiquity of a Jomon language, we'd expect it to show far greater internal diversity. So um, the, the, these are some points that uh, John makes, that uh, even as early as 1960, Hattori and Chiri arrived at a date of around 900 AD for the appearance of the Ainu language based on their investigation of about 19 Ainu varieties or dialects spoken in both Hokkaido and Sakhalin. Um, the problems with lexical statistics or glottal chronology related to the assumption of a fixed rate of lexical replacement. And we know that fairly well, but the vocabulary retention rates in the Ainu data collected by Hattori and Chiri show clearly higher rates of retention than the Japanese and Ryukyuan data analyzed by Hattori some years earlier in 54. Um, Hattori figured that a date of about 1500 to 1800 years ago fit for Ryukyuan language. Uh, Lian Hasegawa um, obtained some data in 2013 through a Bayesian analysis of Hattori and Chiri's data. So they went back and looked at the data and they arrived at a date of around AD 650 for Proto-Ainu. And so the point here is that loan words are not sporadic and must be from the parent language. And some of the loans appear to predate the 8th century AD. So from a linguistic standpoint, the dates for Proto-Ainu correlate better with the inception of Satsumon than with the epijomon. Another paradox involving the locus of the Ainu language is that uh, as early as Chamberlain's work in 1887, uh, we've been aware that place names, Ainu place names, have a wide distribution in Honshu. And 
so many times uh, people who are interested in the Ainu like to remind me th about this Ainu place name issue. And by some accounts, these goes far west as Kyushu. And uh, the great time depth of Jomon settlement leads to expectations that there were many Jomon languages. It's not plausible that the entire Jomon population from Hokkaido to Kyushu spoke a single language such as Proto-Ainu. So an explanation for the distribution of these Ainu toponyms um, that also accounts for the extensive Japonic influence seen in Proto-Ainu is that Ainu developed as a contact language spoken as a second language by diverse Jomon and some Yayoi populations. This is similar to the Cree language in Canada, a language that became a lingua franca by, um, used by native groups and Europeans and so forth and developed um, varieties that, um, such as Oji Cree. So if we so the linguistics, and this is where the conversation between John Whitman and me got really interesting, is that we saw a very direct correlation between what we see in, in the archaeological record and linguistics. And, um, and so if we look at this, just to wrap up, the 1992 model of this unilineal development leading to a duality of, um, of, uh, of Japanese origins is... is not surprisingly, far more complex. And the language issues seem to fit nicely with the archaeological record. Now there is a bit of a, an, inter an interesting uh, argument that might come up, and that is that um, a few years ago there was a publication, I think it was in PLOS One, that indicated that the Ohotsk language had a significant role to play in the development of the Ainu language. And um, from what, from my conversation with John Whitman, that our argument is not, I mean, it's consistent with that too. There is a place for the Ohotsk language in this, in this newer model. And uh, I certainly can't explain it, but, um, but it certainly be, can, can be kept in, in this model. But this complex picture is probably a more accurate one that describes how the Ainu developed and what the various contributors are to both their biology and culture. So I'll leave it there for now. How are you doing? Oh, Thank you very much. Good timing. Sorry, yes. That, I don't imagine those would convert to pre-1950. I mean, what, what, when is the P in that BP? No, it would be, it would be 1950. Okay, so it is set up like a radiocarbon dating. Absolutely, absolutely, okay, Ab absolutely. Yep, yep. Nice. But calibrated, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm trying to look, what was I, what was I trying to, what was I trying to do with the purple? Um, I can't tell you right now. I'm looking forward to the written version. Yes. Well, we need to, yeah, we, we need to talk about that. Um, the other thing is the Jomo part, which is all in light green, mm -hmm. right now, Well, many, many haplotypes, for example, is what you're saying. Right, and hard to, hard to show that here exactly. And there's so much work to be done mm -hmm. on this. So my question is, is it affecting the mitochondrial DNA analysis? I, I have no idea. Um, in Ada I think you'd have to go to Adachi's paper. And of course, they simply point out that they've got a limited sample. Mm -hmm. And there are other haplotypes that they would like to explore to see if it's if if they're getting it in the in the say the Hokkaido samples for example, for sure. So, a lot to happen. And of course, the other issue that I keep asking people in Hokkaido about is where is the Satsumon DNA, and there is none. 
because the burial, Satsuma burials are, are so poorly preserved that they're not getting anything from them. And it's a frustrating absence from the database. So in terms of the main point of your talk, am I mm -hmm. correct that you're saying that you see a big um, discontinuity from epigermon to satsumon in terms of mm -hmm. macroscopic data and uh, the linguistic data seems to be matching? Right. As our, as our hypothesis, what I, would, what I would say, though, is that I think what I would love to see is someone to really go in and sort of tease out what's going on with the epigermon and how the epigermon play into this, this whole model. Because I, I'm not, I, do you know if anyone's thinking much about this? I haven't made any connection with scholars who may be. Mm -hmm. to a extent. Right. So I'm sure he's interested in that topic. Yeah, we've he's talked. He's also interested in the cohort influence mm -hmm. and a bunch of people, of course, you know, because of the bear cult. Mm -hmm. um, how the, in terms of the Ain culture, um, the, the proto Ain culture's establishment, to what extent cohorts were influenced, mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. what extent that matches or doesn't match people's movement. I think that's part of that. Right. Um, yep. Yep. Yes. I found the diagram of the different food um, groups to be very interesting. Um, the birds came in for a little bit, the deer oh. and the salmon, yeah. you know, shifting and then more seeds. And it, it seemed to me, by the way that you were laying it out, that each of those tiers tended to be related to a site that you could date to closer to Jomon or further away from mm -hmm, Jomon. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, yeah. And, and then one, one was kind of in the middle. Yeah. And then the other question I have, considering your interest in the seeds, is mm -hmm. did you start to look at any climate data for those periods? Because there are people now who are starting to be able to identify. Yeah, the, the, there's climate data. Uh, the thing about this, these, these plants is they have huge ranges. So these plants aren't particularly sensitive to, to these kinds of changes. Um, Chestnut's an interesting problem because uh, it's not supposed to even be native to Hokkaido, but it shows up pretty early there, and, uh, and so it's there. And we find it in the archaeological record in the late Jomon and even earlier, and it's, it's there. Um, so, um, but most of these, no, they're quite, um, quite happy under quite a range of of climatic variation, they are. And uh, many of those are quite anthropogenic, so they do respond well to long-term human impact or management. So one of the, the th points we're trying to make with the epigermon stuff is that the, this anthropogenesis and plant management seems to be declining, which means that they're probably using specific locales not as regularly, so they're somehow places are losing their, their specific draw for family lineages and so forth. Although, say for K135, it was used from the beginning of the epigomon right to the end. So it had a draw, but the evidence is against them having lived there continuously. So you'll have flood deposits that separate the early Zokujomon from the later Zokujomon. So it's really nice to, so these deposits are quite deep. You'll get an epijomon layer here, flood, epijomon layer here, a flood, and more epijomon. So you're able to really tease the different subperiods out. So we have to publish all that stuff. We're still working on that. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also animal foods as well deciding to eat a lot of salmon at a particular point. And then you've got these these kind of these separations of different occupations. Is there a potential for like, I'm wondering what would be driving people if you say there's not so much climactic shift, so there's less likely to be a crash in terms of plant foods that suddenly were unavailable for whatever reason. What would be some of the factors driving people to move from one plant food to another plant food? 
I th it's, it's opportunism, and I think we need to look at some ecological variables. So for example, in the nuts, what we do know about nut trees is they don't produce a huge mast every year. It may be three, four, five years. So it's when they go back to their place, it's not that walnut is there, but oh, there's lots of chestnut this year, so we're going to exploit that. So it's opportunistic, I think, is what I'm, what I'm driving at. It's more opportunistic. The big question is, why have they shifted from the final Jomon patterns to this more opportunistic, mobile, scattered existence? If I was working anywhere else, say, for example, Eastern North America, the first thing that would come to my mind is epidemiology. When you have cultures in contact from disparate places, you bring diseases. But there's no, we don't have any evidence for that. We don't know, but it's a hypothesis. Um, could it be some other um, cultural disruption that is pushing population to decline and people, maybe people are moving out and, uh, and there is a, a smaller population staying behind. But these are questions that I wish people would work on. I'd love to get a PhD student, uh, find somebody in Hokkaido who might really be interested in tackling this issue. We, we've got the facts, but we don't even know what the questions are. We're getting at trying to define the questions right now, but we need some people to tackle them. I need another lifetime. <laughs> well, the richness of the um, pile of botanical remains is amazing. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came up to me is people tend to lump walnuts and chestnuts together as nuts. Yes. But when I talk to farmers in Kohoku, uh, walnuts, uh, they are really, really tasty, the best food that they can think of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chestnut is part of the staple food, it's mm -hmm. starchy food. Mm -hmm. Walnut is something like only when you have at a very particular ceremonial occasion. So uh, I think part of the question may be that when chestnut comes in as starchy staple food versus what kind of other millets were there, um, and I think walnut may fall into a separate category in terms of their foods. Yeah. Um, the food. Yeah, the, I, there's so many options that we have to consider for sure. There's a little bit of acorn here too. Tuber, I have to consider, yeah. Uh, you know that old bay leaf, yes. tuber. Yep. How far does the history go back? I'm hoping Emma, a PhD student of right. mine, might be able to address that through starch grain analysis. But I, anyway, um, I actually don't know. We, we, we don't get sort of macro evidence for it. Uh, so we'd have to look for other kinds of evidence for it and, and see. But, uh, but Uba Yuri is this, is this wonderful plant that the Ainu made into these sort of disc-like cakes to a fantastic starch source. And, and this responds to disturbance very nicely. So you can walk over the Hokkaido University campus and you see this stuff everywhere. You go to the Kyusu Earthworks in the fall and it's covered in and you wonder, you sort of wonder if these are relic populations from way, way back, the, from plantings and so forth. You just don't know. So much to work on. Well, I'm, I'm part of the, so Adachi's paper says about 30% is Ohotsk, uh, for example. And no, there is some data. They do suggest this breakdown. And I'd have to go back to the paper to see exactly what they're looking at. But they, they sort of divide it into, um, into sort of a, a I, don't, I don't want to represent their paper incorrectly. So I'll just okay. stop there. But, but it is based on that. Yeah, yep, it, it is. Okay. Okay. Um, so, for what you presented, the plant sequence I think is fairly clear. Mm -hmm. How does that match with the Takase paper in which salmon, well, fish, presumably salmon, yeah. um, 
what's increasing. Yeah. Uh, flotation data fits it beautifully. I mean, uh, for example, um, the nice thing about K135 is that a lot of those fish bones came out of the flotation samples, the heavy fractions. So we have the plants from it and the salmon from it, and it fits nicely. Uh, and you'll, but you'll get a layer, as I recall, at K135, you'll get a layer where there's mostly deer, and then another layer where it's most, mostly salmon. There's also spatial separations, too. So it's not just at one particular period you have a lot of chestnut. It's within a 10, 10 by 10 meter area. It's all chestnut. So you know in that area they were processing and discarding the chestnut. Over here they were processing and, and, and uh, discarding the, the walnut too. So it's all spatially delineated too. I'm not sure about the salmon, but I've got to go back and spend some time with Takase Sensei and we can write all this stuff up. Mm -hmm. But for what you showed us, that's not necessarily. That Depends on the period, the site. I think this is a problem Which when I you start averaging things together and throwing everything together. What, what I find interesting is I like examining the diversity and, and through time and space. Yes, hi. really can't answer that question. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, though, husks were intrusive, certainly, and then as they learn more about their place and time, they, they must have adjusted. Um, but there are th you, one also hears, miscon like what you hear often is the husks were hunting and gathering people. But they had pigs and barley, and, that, and so they're not strictly hunters and gatherers. They had this very specific regime, which is unique. It's not like the Satsumon, and it's not like the Epijomon. And this is something they brought in from mainland Northeast Asia. So uh, I did some work on flotation from, from the Ohotsk period, but um, in my particular case, my samples weren't particularly enlightening, unfortunately. And subsequently, people did better work. But just sorry, I can't answer that question properly. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about like, material culture, maybe. Um, I see lots of evidence for like, life ways and kind of like food sourcing that um, kind of represents this opportunistic type of um, consumption. And I'm wondering if there are things besides like food. Um, like I know you mentioned the key of art. Mm -hmm. um, Um, not, not, a, not a great deal. Uh, one of the things, when you look at the Satsumon culture, essentially what you have is the pots. You get almost no stone tools. So what they're using is perishable and some iron. And, um, and the, 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 I would have to go back to, to see what the Epijomon technology is all about, but it's, it strikes me that it's more like the, 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 the later Jomon stuff, the final and all of that, but I can't speak authoritatively on, on that. But um, I think we need to do, in terms of food ways and so forth, this is where residue analysis needs to come in and see what they're actually cooking in these pots and, and, and so on. But um, there's, there's so much to do, so much to do. It's incredible. <laughs> And uh, in the in, in the Fugope cave, there there there's a wonderful example of a there's a deer scapula laid on the floor with a broken epijomon pottery rim sitting in the scapula, and it's laid on the floor. And it's it's what is what does that mean? Was there something in that um, pot, and so forth? So. 
people, I'm sure people have more questions, but there are some teas and coffee cookies in the atrium, so we can continue our conversation sure. over there. And please uh, thank Professor Gary for having My pleasure, Thank you.